I hope everybody understands me. Well, um, first a little disclaimer. I'm not the person who coded this, um, what I'm going to show you. So I'm not the person who created open chatting language. I'm just a user and I like it. And uh, the reason why I'm presenting here is because I hope that uh, similar systems might end up in other programs as well. Like um, there are a lot of other Libre graphics programs and I guess um, a nice plugin system with a nice coding syntax that um, helps to get contributions from artists is pretty sure something that um, would benefit quite a lot of programs. Um, first I got a small question. Who in the audience is an artist? Okay. Who's a coder? Okay. Who is both? Ah, okay, quite a few. Um, well, I'm a Blender user for a few years now and uh, Blender is actually the number one Libre graphics application that I'm using and Blender is actually very, very, very big. It's an extremely big application with a lot and lots and lots of features and it has the problem that um, for one thing um, there are many more features we would need, which somebody needs to code. And on the other hand, it has the problem that um, there are coming contributions from everywhere, but um, what should end up in Blender and what is, uh, what's, what's going to be rejected. And uh, if it's going to be rejected, maybe there are users who want to use it. So um, it's always a difficult situation. But uh, one thing that solved this kind of situation for one very specific part of Blender for the Cycles Render Engine was the addition of the open shading language. It's um, a success story I'm presenting here. And it's a story about artists creating their own tools, sharing them with others, and actually contributing to Blender in a way that does not interfere with the core development. So people were just started producing great new plugins and great new shaders. And the example I'm going to use here are procedural textures. Even though some people used open shading language even to create completely new tools for Blender, which is also cool. But um, my example here will um, be only about procedural textures. And uh, what I basically want you to remember is what happened when open shading language was introduced in the Cycles Render Engine and um, how the contributions exploded from everywhere and how artists now have the choice of a wide range of procedural textures while beforehand the range was limited to only the core procedural textures artists would be using. So actually um, open shading language wasn't the first plug-in system for writing procedural textures in Blender. On the left, you're not supposed to actually read this. Um, this is a um, code that was used to create a very simple shader uh, for Blender 2.49, a very, very simple procedural texture. It's 100 lines and roughly 80 lines of this is boilerplate and uh, stuff that you just had to write and create and manage only to get the texture into the system. And on the right, what you see is the very same texture improved with a lot of new features in just 25 lines of code and it's actually pretty readable and um, you have just basically two parts. You have at the top the inputs and on the bottom the math that's actually doing the texture and creating the texture. And also, the texture, um, yeah, this is the 15 lines version of the texture um, for cycles. Because the, in Blender 2.49, we had this 100 lines of code for what you can do within 15 lines here. And it's also integrated well with the Blender cycles node system. 
it's basically a um, system of yeah. You, you obviously, uh, I guess everybody's familiar with the concept of nodes that you have a flow of data, and you can man you manipulate the data in each node. And uh, because the open shading language is so well integrated into the node systems, um, I was able when I wrote this shader, I ported it over from Blender 2.49 to um, outsource functionality into other cycles nodes. And um, what you see here is basically um, I rebuilt the functionality of the original um, shader. It's a Pi procedural texture with cycles nodes and a um, small, this very small script here. So this, uh, what you see is um, well, roughly 100% what the old 100 lines of code were doing in Blender internal. But because it was so well integrated into this um, node system, this graphical programming interface, you could actually uh, do changes. What you see here is um, take a look at the, um, the box or the cube and you see that there is a little bit of noise in the edges. That was basically how much noise you could add in the old version. It also had this function to add noise. But um, because we had this new system where we have uh, small pieces of code working together with nodes, we could change it in a way that we could really distort it, the texture. And we could even simply exchange the nodes. And this way also the noise we want to use to distort it and we would get a um, completely new pattern. Patterns actually the only with very, very, very little code we needed to write. And um, so this is the present now. And um, in the past, Blender had the problem that only very few people would uh, write additional plugins because it was so complicated, it was very difficult, and you need, had, had needed uh, knowledge of C, you needed knowledge um, of uh, the Blender internals, how Blender to internal is used here for handling data structures and everything. And um, we had also the problem that um, for non plugin textures, the developers rejected a lot of textures that were for special purposes because uh, they did, didn't want node creep, they didn't want you to uh, open up the menu to add a texture and you would have 50 different textures. And uh, now that we integrated this um, shading language, we have actually hundreds of small scripts flying around the internet um, that are giving us the artists new possibilities to create um, new shaders and um, new textures. And um, we can also now customize our nodes and our tools thanks to this. And we don't interfere anymore with the Blender core development. So basically, um, this was actually very cool, open shading language. You see um, at this example, once again, just a little bit of code uh, can make quite a bit difference. This texture wasn't available in Blender before, now it is. and. Um, yeah, it's very, really highly customized here. You can do a lot of customization. And um, so if you want to uh, get the same success um, for your um, project, here is why this open shading language was a success. Um, well, first of all, it integrates well with the system because these uh, nodes we have are already a kind of programming. And now we also have the uh, possibility to have a shader system that's actually Turing complete, where you, where you can do anything, roughly anything, uh, not anything yet. That means um, there's still a few functionalities missing, but um, and it's all plug-in. So it's all a plug-in system. It's nothing that you uh, have to integrate into the core of the software. And the syntax of this open shading language is actually pretty similar to a, a syntax of programming language many artists in our field, in the 3D field, already know. Because many people are, for example, doing game development and then they are writing shaders in GLSL. Or maybe some people are still old school and uh, know the old Pixar Render Man, where they did um, write their shader in Render Man shading language, or the DirectX people um, use probably HSL. And um, the core of this open shading language plugin system is that we have no boiler code at all. We only define inputs and how we, uh, what we do with the data. That's it. So um, yeah, one can just sit down and write um, a shader from scratch in just like three or four lines of code. And um, 
this is actually a pretty cool for um, people who are artists and maybe just um, create a node setup and want to add a small uh, extra features and they maybe know a bit of math but not so much about programming and they can still add for example a small piece of code that crea creates a formula a mathematical formula and um, processes it and um, also the cool thing about this open shading language is that it's nearly live coding so it's um, very good for artists especially because you see you get the direct feedback of what you're doing and um, basically this is why um, open shading language really extended the toolkits available for Blender users um, here are a few resources um, basically the uh, Third one is a really huge collection. Somebody just collected open shading language shaders from all over the web. But it's now no longer updated, but it's still a great resource. Or um, the, fourth one, the fourth one, that's by me. Uh, I sometimes need to write shaders for my work. And um, I always share them. I put them under MIT license and bang, everybody can use them, I don't care. And um, then the, um, the one, one step to the last. Um, yeah, that's also something I did. Uh, I created an introduction on how to port other shaders to open shading language because um, I'm greedy and I want more uh, shaders so I have more tools available but I don't have time to write the tools my own, on my own so I told, just tell other people how to do it and maybe they will port something that I can use. And yeah, I hope this was done in oh, 30 minutes, perfect. And um, yeah, one thing I wanted to show you is the first one actually. Um, this is this 50 lines of code you have seen. You can create all of this with it. So um, each one of these lollipops uh, uses this 50 lines of code shader. And the sun in the background as well. So, okay, um, questions?